everyone, my name is Amanda and this video is a CARS practice session using the worksheet asking the right questions. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can go down to the description below, click on the link and download the worksheet to follow along. Okay, so for today we're really focusing just on the reading portion of the car section. We're not going to be doing any practice problems today. Instead, we're going to focus on how to read effectively and prime yourself for what you're about to read in each passage. So let's get started. So as you can see, this is a snippet of a passage, and we can use these snippets to practice the priming and reading and outlining skills that are going to be essential to finishing the car section efficiently and on time on test day. So the first thing you want to do whenever you hit a new passage, whether you're reading for pleasure or for the car section, is to take a quick snapshot of what you're about to read. So kind of let your eyes draw over these two paragraphs and decide for yourself what the subject is. Take a second now. All right, so I'm reading this. I see words like altruism and morality and evolution and humans. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this in the category of philosophy. Again, you can find all the subjects that are found on the CAR section on the What's on the MCAT exam document on the AAMC website. Link is in the description below. So, okay, subject is philosophy. That should give you kind of a gut feeling. <laughs> Do I like this subject? Do I hate philosophy, right? Are you excited to read this or not? So holding that thought in mind, glancing through the language, how difficult is the language for you? So I'm saying to myself, okay, we'll often speak of genes as being selfish, meaning, okay, I see the word but, I see this person who's clearly being referenced as an example, I see the word suckered, which is more casual language, so I'm going to give this a medium. It's not easy, but it's not the most challenging thing I've ever read either, right? If you're not sure if it's easy or hard, it's probably immediate. Now, how long in this passage? Obviously it's short because we're only looking at a section of the passage, but anything over five paragraphs should go in the long category. Six or seven paragraphs for the car section is generally long. Anything shorter than that is medium to short. Four paragraphs, three paragraphs, super short. Okay, so now the most important question, and the one you should always ask yourself before diving into the passage is, do you like this? Are you excited to read this? Will this be enjoyable for you? Or is this going to be a little tough to read? All right, for me, I don't like this passage. I'm not a huge fan of philosophy. I have a hard time kind of wrapping my head around moral concepts. So I'm going to go ahead and give this a no. Generally speaking, the more you like something, the more willing you are to read it, right? So if this is going to be a challenging read for you purely on the like-dislike scale, prepare for that. Say, okay, I'm gonna have to take more notes or I'm going to have to you know, keep pulling myself back into the passage and following along with the author's argument. So now let's go into the reading section. So here are the reading rules just to review again, highlighting rules. No more than six words highlighted in a row, right? Little snippets and only three to four highlights per paragraph unless it's proper nouns. And the reason why, just to really kind of hammer this point home, is because the highlighting tool is meant to be guideposts. It's meant to bring your eye back to key topics. If too much is highlighted, that defeats the purpose of having a signpost in that paragraph or that passage. Outline rules, all right, keeping the labels brief. What that means is you're just writing short fragments, right? You do not need to write full sentences on your notes on the MCAT and really only using essential words or even shorthand or abbreviation. The more comfortable you get with your own personal shorthand, the faster this process will go. Again, everything should be interpretation, avoiding copying the author's words, right? That means that really it should be like, what are you getting from the section that you're reading, right? What is the gist rather than just copying down what's already written, right? We don't have time for that. You are going to have access to the passage for all the questions. So this is not note taking in the classic style, right? This is outlining again to give yourself a reference point when you're answering questions and making it easier to interpret the main point. So let's get started. 
And I'm going to go ahead, guys, and I'm just going to walk through this passage exactly how I would read it on test day. I'm just going to be talking out loud as I do it. So, of course, it's going to take me a little bit more time. My suggestion here is to pause the video now, read, outline, and highlight this on your own, and then watch what I do and compare your outlines and highlights to mine. Okay? So pause the video, read the passage, come back to me when you're done, and we'll go ahead and do it together. All right, ready to get started? Here we go. Again, I'm going to read this out loud, and I'm going to let you know what I'm thinking by talking out loud as we go through this passage. So I kind of give you some definitions and some key things to look out for as I read this. So evolutionary theorists, I like highlighting people, right, categories of people, often speak of genes as being selfish. Interesting. They put things in quotations often if they're defining it in a different way than like the dictionary would define it. And sure enough, we have a comma and then what is clearly a definition in context of this passage for what it means to be selfish. So meaning that they can only influence an animal to do things that will spread copies of that gene. Right, so I'm going to go ahead and highlight that because I get that, right? Okay. We're saying that genes induce an animal to act in a way to just spread more copies of that gene. If that was a tough read for you, I would have recommended taking a second and reinterpreting that because it's the first sentence. And the first sentence and your correct interpretation of that first sentence often defines how well you understand the overall argument. So for me, I'm like, okay, I get this. And next up, we see something that's really common in most persuasive essays, which is that we're given a claim, right? Evolutionary theories often speak of genes as being selfish, definition of selfish. And then immediately we get a rebuttal with this difference word, but, right? And this, com this is a very common setup in essays where they present an idea and then they immediately refute it and spend the rest of the essay kind of showing why they refuted that argument. So this author says, but one of the most important insights into the origins of morality is that selfish genes can give rise to generous creatures as long as those creatures are selective in their generosity. Okay, so now we're starting to get the main idea here. So I'm going to switch over to my outline here and my outline I usually do by paragraph just so it's easier for me to reference back. So this would be paragraph one and the author's point that I'm seeing here, and this is very tone language, right? Most important insights is that selfish genes can give rise to generous creature. So I'm going to go ahead and write selfish gene, right? S gene gives rise to generous creature. And then I see the word altruism just ahead. So I'm going to go ahead and use that as my label altruism. Um, as long as they're selective, right? So I'm going to go and write selective or select underneath. And the reason why I write it underneath is this is like a, a caveat, right? It's a modification of the original argument. So I wanted to add it in as long as they're selective, right? Maybe it's a bad thing. They're not selective. And I'm going to go ahead and assume and this is an assumption that this is the author opinion. And because I'm not sure, I'm going to write it with a question mark because the author could be setting us up for another counter argument, right? Probably not, but it always is something you want to be aware of. So I'm going to go ahead and assume that this is the author opinion. And then I hope that the next couple sentences will confirm or deny that hunch. So let's keep reading. Altruism toward kin kin is a new group, right? So we're going to highlight that, is not a puzzle at all, okay? Altruism towards non-kin, on the other hand, has presented one of the longest running puzzles in the history of evolutionary thinking. So I'm going to pause here and explain something really important about how they set you up on the MCAT. Notice, we had two claims back to back, right? So the first claim was altruism towards kin is not a puzzle at all. Could you argue that? Probably. It's like, wait, how do you know this, right? Like, where is this coming from? Where's the evidence? Where's kind of the examples? Like, 
sure, it kind of makes sense, right? Like you would probably take care of your child or your mother. And that means, you know, you're not selfish, you're generous. But there's nothing in this passage that supports that claim, which means it's an unsupported claim. And unsupported claims are highly testable because they'll say, sometimes directly in a question stem, something like, which of the following is not supported by anecdote, example, or evidence, right? And this would be a great example of that, of that unsupported claim, right? Because they're just saying like, yeah, we're assuming you're all on the same board with this, that we all agree this, I don't have to prove this to you, and now I can move on to my next point which is a flaw in the argument. So whenever you see this obvious, like I call them kind of dangling claims, right? Where it's like obviously an opinion and it's unsupported by anything else, just take note of it because it might be tested in this upcoming questions. But we're gonna move on for now, just make a note. So now we're saying altruism towards non-kin has presented one of the longest running puzzles in the history of evolutionary thinking, a big step towards its solution, right? So now we kind of have like, again, this claim that this was a puzzle, the kin thing was not a puzzle, and now we're working towards the solution to this puzzle. So we're just kind of kind of go along with the author here so far. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight solution, and then 1971, Robert Trivers published his theory of reciprocal altruism. All right, so we're setting ourselves up in this paragraph now. We kind of have a good idea of what this paragraph is talking about, and we're setting ourselves up for kind of support of this new idea about reciprocal altruism, whatever that is, right? So I'm going to go ahead and say non, I'm going to just kind of keep drawing an arrow here, non kin y right? Because this is important. It's like kind of the main idea so far, right? And then paragraph two is going to be Robert Trivers, which I'm going to go ahead and just kind of underline here. And then that way I can bring it down to paragraph two. So notice my outlining style, right? It's very arrows focused. I have a lot of like flow charts. That's kind of how my brain works. So for you, it might be a little bit more diagrammatic. You may have boxes or something like that, or just words are fine. As long as it's fast and intuitive for you, the format doesn't really matter. But notice here, right? I don't have that many actual words. It didn't take me that long to write. So if you have like eight, 10, 12 words in your outline label, it's a little too much. You wanna kind of pare that down to the essentials only and or use symbols to help make that faster, right? It just takes longer to write eight or 10 words than it does to write five or six and a couple of arrows. Okay, let's keep going. We wanna hear about what Robert Trivers has to say about his reciprocal altruism, right? And so we're gonna go ahead and assume that that's what this next paragraph is gonna be about. So let's kind of dive in here. Trivers noted that evolution could create altruists, I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that, in a species where individuals could remember their prior interactions, prior interactions with other individuals, and then limit their current niceness to those who are likely to repay the favor. Okay, so again, does that make sense to you? Cool, we're gonna be nice to people who are nice to us, kind of golden rule style. If that makes complete sense to you, you don't need to write it down, right? We highlighted the key words, we get this, it's support for this idea of reciprocal altruism. So far, so good. Again, if that was a little confusing for you, take a second, rewrite it, write the relationship down. Okay, we humans are obviously such a species such strong language, right? Such a claim. (laughs) So we're obviously such a species. Trivers propose that we evolved a set of moral emotions that make us play tit for tat. Human life is a series of opportunities for mutual benefit cooperation. Neighbors do this, co-workers do that for millions of years. Okay, notice how I sped up there. Right? Notice how I'm like, okay, da 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 The second you get the gist, right? The main idea, okay, like we get this. Well, I'll be nice to you if you be nice to me. I'll be generous to you if you be generous to me. The rest of this paragraph, up until the last sentence, right, 
is just examples of what this reciprocal altruism is, which means we do not really need to pay attention or kind of need to have a deep understanding of this neighbors loaning each other tools or coworkers covering each other's shifts. You still want to read it because it might be referenced as an example in a question, but we don't need to really interpret it or kind of deep dive. And here is where we can speed up our reading. It is a good idea to pause here and just kind of make a note of your outline, right? So Robert Travers equals recip alt, right? So you could just write RA here, but for me, um, one letter abbreviations are usually people. And then if it's things, I usually just do kind of like a shorter abbreviation. Recipro reciprocal alt, this is an ALT. I know it looks a little weird with my handwriting here, um, equals like exchange is what I'm going to just kind of write because that's kind of my personal interpretation is that this is an exchange between people and then we could say humans check and then we're going to go ahead and say you always want to ask at this stage is the author in agreement with this other person right whenever there's a new person you want to say is the author in agreement with this other person or are they using them to counter a point or to argue against it in this case i'm pretty sure this author likes Robert Trivers, right, he's using it to support a concept he himself brought up. So I'm going to go ahead and say author opinion agrees, right? It's always good to make a note of whether or not the author is consistently agreeing, disagreeing, or maybe you have no idea what the author thinks. No matter what, important to make that note. So now let's finish up this paragraph. For millions of years, I'm going to go ahead and highlight. <laughs> Our ancestors faced the adaptive challenge of reaping these benefits without getting suckered. Those whose moral emotions compelled them to play tit for tat reap more of these benefits than those who played any other strategy. Okay, so again, nothing new here. It's just saying that this is evolutionary based. I'm not going to make any additions, but notice how this is setting us up for what would be future paragraphs, right? About maybe the evolutionary basis of this and why it's still effective in today's society is maybe the prediction I would make. Okay, concluding remarks. So whenever you finish reading something, whether it's on the MCAT or anything in practice, pause just for a second and be like, what did I just read? So we just read a passage that was describing altruism and trying to explain why humans act altruistically for people who are not their family, right? So this is an explanatory essay bordering on persuasive, right? There's some strong language here. And it's really trying to explain a phenomena that the author assumes you understand. So with that basis, we're looking for a lot of evidence and examples and explanations for this theory of reciprocal altruism that Robert Trivers notices. In other paragraphs, we might be looking for more people beyond Robert Trivers that would give us further evidence or explanations or research on this topic, or maybe even a counterpoint against reciprocal altruism, maybe another theory for why we see altruism for non-kin, right? So we could expect a whole bunch of different things here, but now we know where we're going, right? We have this kind of roadmap of like, okay, we're talking about altruism, we're talking about how humans interact with each other, this is definitely philosophical and it's present day, and the author has clear opinions about what he's writing about. So types of questions that could be asked could be, you know, what does the author think about certain subjects? Suppose that someone acted in an altruistic way to a stranger that they were never gonna see again. What would that do to the author's argument, right? We can really predict the types of questions that would come up in an essay like this. And by doing so, you're prepared for the questions on the MCAT if you got a similar type of passage. Thank you guys so much for joining me for this CARS practice. I hope that was helpful. And remember, the name of the game for all CARS skills is to consistently work on them using the priming questions, reading with outlines and highlights, and taking a moment after you finish reading to say, what did I just read? Do I agree? And what was the author's purpose? Thank you so much again, and I hope you join me in the next video.